Ah, okay, good. We didn't start the recording, but essentially that's the first concept also for the record and for the recording. That planetary mapping means different things to different uh, professionals. Um, now, I was mentioning that things are related to data, and they, we are data limited uh, because again we are an observational discipline largely with uh, with planetary mapping, and which means that the amount of data is directly related to uh, the missions that are available. For example, this is not up to date, but I think it's the best uh, infographic that I found through the years. And if the pit is not up to date, one someone should actually continue it because it shows the different solar system bodies or classes uh, by which missions are, uh, uh, so to say, analyzed, covered, and not only by which missions, but also uh, by which series of missions. For example, you can see that a little uh, a line alone means a single mission. But when you see, for example, moving ahead with the time, that there are many parallel lines means that a certain place has more than one mission, which means that there is a, a series, a, a set of missions that can be used for mapping. This also explains why, uh, for example, Mars and the Moon and Mercury, to some extent, they have a lot of mapping uh, uh, data and a lot of cartography, just because there is a lot of independent or related missions that allow for an extremely high richness of the data sets that can be used. Sometimes even too much data, right? Because you have to consider that before, in the 70s, that are not imaged here, essentially all the mapping that was done in the 80s and large part of the 90s was done with effectively one data set, Viking orbiter images in the case of Mars. And that's not the case. Now, of course, we are flooded with data in some areas, particularly for the moon, because you have uh, US mission, European mission, Chinese mission, Indian mission, and the same for Mars, Emirates mission. Uh, this clearly uh, offers both uh, challenges, but also, of course, offer advantages because uh, uh, using uh, uh, an increment, a, a, a complementary set of data sets uh, helps a lot with uh, constraining, for example, surface composition, uh, nature of materials, and overall geology. Now, when we do this, we typically use orbiters because orbiters are able to take, uh, you know, large dot images and they're very suitable to provide use uh, uh, 2D or 3D large models of the surface. And typically maps are need a base, which is provided by these orbital data. But in reality, uh, as we do maps in, on Earth, we are using also mostly people or donkeys carrying uh, samples that are selected by geologists on the, on the mountains. Uh, the way we do it uh, on, uh, on planet is also including landers or rovers or additional platforms that can provide either ground truth like rovers or can provide other data that can be complementing. Uh, but effectively, a lot of the things that we'll be mentioning are related to orbital data. And a lot of things you will see also later uh, with the use cases from Xavier, from Xavier are also uh, orbital based. By, by all means, platform helpful in producing geologic maps or geologic models are also rovers. For example, the Chinese rovers on the moon were able to produce geologic models due to the GP, to uh, a ground penetrating radar on the moon, and the same goes for the NASA uh, or, or um, CNC, uh, uh, Chinese rovers on, on Mars. When it comes to the data underlying the mapping, there is also a wide range of data used, uh, but most of the things are used for geologic mapping are typically optical data in, in various uh, wavelength ranges uh, and uh, uh, either radar or, or LIDAR or laser, uh, which again optical, um, for extracting range information or topography. There are obviously other ways to extract topography from, from stereo images uh, via photogrammetry, but effectively uh, the the type of data used is relatively limited in, in terms of, of bandwidth. But again, uh, uh, the little uh, rectangle that you see 
with, for, for example, for or below and in the figure for omega chrism, in reality, it's uh, a lot of information compressed because typically they are like multi reference spectral imagery with tens to hundreds of bands that are used. So this graph is not really showing anything on the information content, but it shows just the range of uh, uh, remote sensing domains and uh, spectrum uh, ranges that are used typically uh, for uh, planetary remote sensing. Again, terrestrial remote sensing is not much different. There is, uh, um, when I was mentioning the, the, it, the meaning of main mapping, the second one producing mosaics, producing models. That's exactly what you will do. On the left, you see what an imager can collect, so individual images. I don't know, you have a CCD that is collecting uh, 2D images. And uh, these images, they have to be somehow put on a map projection, which here seems simple, but obviously there is a lot of complexity. It's for now a big black box, but effectively that step is key. This is the step that is used not only for ma geologic mapping, but also for any kind of spatial analysis or planning or uh, intelligence. Uh, you need to bring the data you collect from an image from a platform to a map. And this is typically done with uh, ancillary data. For example, your spacecraft is somewhere orbiting Mars, and you have to know somewhere at which point in the orbit it is, which is the angle of the spacecraft that's from the center of mass of the solar system, or which is the local incident angle of the sun, and which is the angle of the, of the um, imager, which is typically a telescope, compared to the normal to the surface or whatever. There is a lot of parameters that need to be either uh, measured or computed in order to then backtrace the position of a certain image onto the surface of a body. And this is by far not trivial. Uh, for planets, it's not trivial. For irregular bodies, it's even more complex. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, that's some step that can be more or less transparent for you. Um, if you look at the links below, you will see some more background to that. But it's a key step um, uh, for the mapping process. Plus, of course, you need the data, and the data has to sit somewhere. Um, this is taken care of by typically space agencies that they have developed through the decade systems and standards for that. And PDS, it's the NASA US derived name or acronym, but it's also a set of standards that has been used throughout a space agency, essentially. It's almost universally used for planetary missions nowadays. Um, it's uh, very. <clears throat> Rich and information, and there also there is this version of the standard. For the time being, what you need is just to know that this exists, and uh, I will really invite you to check some of the resources that are linked below. One thing: how many data do we have for planetary data? Well, it's difficult to say, but you can see here some uh, volumes estimated for cumulative times. You see, two and a half petabytes. <clears throat> Any questions? No, I should not. Thanks. Now, if you check, I have to observation data one order of magnitude more. This tells something, of course, that we have more data on Earth than on planets. But we do have also different kind of uh, observation platforms. We have much more on Earth, and we also have many more uses for Earth observation. Now, this also brings to the point of who is using this data? And how many people actually are using this data? Where are many machines? I mean, now in this year, you think more of machines because there is a lot of like, analysis that is done via machines, via algorithms. 30 years ago, it was mostly humans. And even the term mapping that now we consider as obvious as a digital process was not digital. Now, this is again a very rough attempt to try and figure out 
how much work has been done on planetary mapping just using one keyword. This is not very um, rigorous. It's very rough as an approach, but it gives an idea that from the 90s until now, the GIS term in scholarly publication using ADS has been increasing. And again, this is just a proxy, one metric. But it's saying that while uh, we got more missions, and you remember the slide on missions, we got more data, and you remember, we got more data, sorry, dark. Basically, we also got more people working on data. Now it's a bit chicken and egg. We have more data, so we have more people looking at the data, or we have more people looking at the data and we have more data. Well, actually it's not chicken and egg because data are limited by the space of collecting them, but the community is growing with that, which means that now there is more people doing planetary mapping essentially than uh, 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 it was the case 20 years ago. Uh, when then you want to compare to the people in the community, this is also again, uh, uh, not a fixed proxy. Um, this is one of the biggest conferences uh, that historically is there since the 70s. Uh, um, in US, uh, there are also versions that are in the, on the planet that doesn't matter, but it gives an idea of the number of people. So this is a, a, so to say a, a window of the community. The community grew to the year, that's clear. In this case, it grew sort of like, uh, 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 more than three times, uh, but the, this is of course globally across all planetary science. But the point is that there is more data, there is more mission data, there is more people looking at this data, and of course there is more uh, mapping going on. Which means also there is more tools that have been developed to that are following, of course, the development of technology, but they're also fo following the, the needs of the people working with the data. A bit more on that more later. This is just, again, a kind of a toy example, uh, which is uh, uh, a bit pretty to see, uh, but you could do the same for most other places. Mars is very suitable because the data are covering a time range, which is very big of several decades, like half a century, um, and obviously we are able to do this. So you can do it yourself on the slide that I shared. But from the early 60s, where all we had were telescopic observation and maps based on this telescopic observation, to the late 60s, to the early 70s, the, the quality of our knowledge and detail on the surface of Mars increased dramatically, right? One, one thing that is interesting is that although here there are like features that are not existing, the large scale albedo features they actually are there, which is very amazing. You have the uh, Hellas, which is full of dust and with low albedo, which is actually very well visible back in the early 60s uh, uh, US Air Force month. And clearly uh, with, the, with the single flybys, or, or very few orbital data, it is difficult to produce detailed motifs. Yeah, that applies to any mission. <laughs> but when you start having um, orbiters like uh, uh, miners or, 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 or Vikings, you have the possibility to collect through time large, image, uh, large amount of data with proper illumination condition, which means that this is suitable for making mosaics. And that's the key. You are not really making very easily geologic maps using flyby data, although you still do it. Uh, but with orbiters, you are able to really control the quality of the data, depending, of course, on mission constraints and, and data constraints and experiment constraints. But this is very difficult to produce local, regional, or global maps. This goes until now. And even old missions like Mars Express, which is like 20 years old, uh, is able to produce you know, data that can be uh, uh, still suitable and improving for time for providing base, map base mapping data. On top of it, as much as we evolve in terms of quality and resolution, um, globally, also locally, that's the case. And as I said, with orbiters, you're not imaging necessarily the surface altogether. I mean, unless you're with weather satellites or with very, very uh, big orbits, uh, but typically you collect 
cumulatively images that you target or that you do systematically to build uh, the model of the surface. The range of, of what data coverage and data resolution is also very uh, wide. You can have extremely long and large work like HRC that you see here, which are covering like almost uh, half of an hemisphere, and they're like several hundreds of kilometers wide, uh, but with the resolution that are moderate to very, very high resolution images like high rise, uh, that are though just uh, uh, um, kilometers to tens of kilometers across. Which means that you will be able to use this uh, as base map with very different level of detail. If you're mapping an entire geologic province, I don't know, a volcanic province like Tarsus, with, with HRST, you, you are able possibly. If you are imaging a single landing site, uh, you may take advantage more of uh, this data that are more high resolution. Plus, there are processing steps involved, uh, which many times are transparent to you, uh, but nevertheless, you should be aware uh, because data are not necessarily science ready when, uh, no, uh, no, uh, by all means, they are not science ready while collected. And in order to become science ready, they have to go to various data reduction uh, steps that uh, are typically instrument dependent or body dependent uh, uh, for the, so to say, the cartography side of it. Um, here, there is some example, this link, some other practical example, but the point is that there are steps. And that's a bit confusing in the sense that nomenclature is different um, in different uh, uh, areas. But in general, the point to consider is that an increasing number uh, gives an idea of the uh, science readiness or processing level, so called, of the data. So when you hear of like something that is level zero or telemetry or row, these are typically data that you collect you will then archive or prepare for archive. Uh, um, typically, they are not using, used in, in uh, PDS archive, but they are kept by experiment teams and by agencies. But what as some basic level of information documentation ends up in archive, uh, like leave at zero data, but they're not necessarily being usable. Uh, so everything that you see from partially processed to calibrated to derived, is what you actually you end up using at different levels with your mapping effort. Whether it's the mapping as base mapping or geologic mapping, it doesn't matter. You are still using the same data set to, to use as a base map for geologic map or to use it as a piece of a mosaic. Um, data evolved, so base map, which means that if you're producing a, mo a model of the surface of the moon of Mars uh, in the 70s or the 80s, um, and you do the same now, you will have different things. First of all, you have different data sets. Uh, moreover, you will have different uh, level of knowledge, for example, of the uh, geodesy of the body, of the control network, of the accuracy of pointing of a, of a spacecraft. The level of accuracy that the modern spacecraft has is much higher than the level of accuracy and orbit determination of a 50 year old spacecraft for the very same solar system body. Which means that you have to expect an evolution of maps, and that's not really a surprise. Also, on Earth, you make a geologic map of an area, and maybe after 50 years, the geologic survey does the map again with new data. In that case, it's new base map. Maybe you have LIDAR and you have much more analytical power to treat your samples and to extract information. And for example, you have more knowledge of biostratigraphy to date sedimentary layers. Here is the same. You have maybe more knowledge of the uh, uh, models of, of, of uh, crater formation and production, and you have higher resolution data that allows you to, to for example, see smaller crater, which means to date surfaces uh, with higher detail. Now, this is the part that, again, um, it's uh, my take on it. And because I saw uh, through the years how it changed. And while everything now is online, uh, back then data were distributed at cd realms then for a short time as DVD, and then ended up online. In fact, the very reason why you called PDF volumes volumes is that they used to be CD volumes, and they were 
sized in order to fit in a CD earlier and then a DVD later. The processing was not so different in the sense that you still have to get some telemetry data from the spacecraft. You have to have somehow this data put in some kind of a, a array or format, depending if it's an image or not, or, or time series. And you have to process it to correct for instrumental effects, to correct for the illumination condition, to make all kind of uh, radiometric, spectral, or geometric correction. The, the concept is the same. What is changing is, of course, the tool. Um, and some of the tools used nowadays, in fact, they were already there since 20, 30 years. So simply, they were running on strange computers and not on your Linux box or your Windows machine or your Mac laptop. On top of it, many of the tools that nowadays you use routinely, and I think that Javier will, will show you some of them, uh, simply are based on, on frameworks or languages that simply didn't exist 30 years ago. Which means that things change a lot in terms of the actual tool you use, but they are changing little in terms of the actual work, so and the steps that you perform. This is something where things change a lot, to be honest. Uh, back then, the tools to perform mapping were mostly expensive, not accessible, uh, not really suitable because they were not made for the task. Um, and this is really an area where major development occurs. Um, I suggest you to have a look at some of the background material. I will provide you with more links to that because there is uh, quite a lot also on the history of it and the progress. But basically, the tool for doing the actual mapping on the data improved dramatically. And now uh, they really uh, uh, give you what was not available to the community uh, when I, uh, I was starting uh, uh, in this business, so to say. Plus, something that I think is also quite important is that nowadays uh, we have definitely much more information. There is much more documentation, there is better documentation, there are many sources, uh, and there is a community, which means that if you have a question now, you have good chances that asking around in the right places or in some places, you get an answer. Uh, this was not the case uh, many years ago and even a few years ago. So in this respect, starting to map uh, now, it's easier than that. Yes, USGS Master Geology was there and was pioneering this, uh, and it was and it is extremely helpful. Uh, but now I think we have much more uh, critical mass of documentation and tools data and community which make it much easier to, to move ahead and to have progress actually both for the training side and for the science side that's something that probably is a bit controversial because uh, if you look around many disciplines try to address the fact that the data are getting complex they're getting many uh, there is published and or perish uh, or published and perish uh, you have to get more science out, you have to do everything fair. Um, should I really start from level zero data and do everything myself? Or is there some kind of a data set that's already ready for me to use? Obviously data will not write a paper for you, but uh, there is a range of science readiness, which is higher than before. 30 years ago, you did have to do everything from for data reduction point of view from scratch. Uh, more or less. Now not, but this is of course a double blade uh, because uh, sometimes it is important to know the limits of the processing chains that have been used or the tools that you're using and not necessarily everything is documented and or transparent, which means that is not the solved issue that data should just work is not necessarily, at least in my view, the only reason. Data should just work but one should be able to, to backtrace also what happened to the data. Because at the end of the day, you have based uh, your interpretation on this data, which means that you have based your interpretation on something that may or may be not a black box. But on the good side, uh, there is many people that know very well their black box and they document it, which means that you can trust, uh, like data set that are provided, for example, from USGS uh, or from experiment teams, 
they know their business, they know their requirements, and if you collect data that have been put, I don't know, digital elevation models produced by the high rise team of OSGS, they know very well the requirement of their business and you can use them for science. This applies to all kinds of data, which means that typically what comes from experiment team has a very good quality stamp and you can trust largely, and also it's typically also uh, described in, in scholarly publications that are attached to the data set. Now, this brings a bit back to the original uh, uh, point of having different kinds of mappings and why we are converging on geologic mapping, because we do want to do something with the data. We want to understand, for example, what is the evolution of a solar system body, or if you are mapping for resources, where we want to land because we want to know where it's volatile, so where it's like uh, hydrated minerals, or other ores. And of course, when we want to land somewhere, uh, we have uh, uh, different kind of aims. But at the end of the day, you need all of that. If you need imaging and mapping, uh, you also need a target. And that's why you see I was introducing this kind of stepped approach, imaging a, a body, then uh, uh, doing the image model, then do the mapping of the image model. This is actually not a linear step. It's actually circular because when you do the imaging and targeting, unless it's the very first time you go there exploring, you may want actually to target something interesting. And that's exactly what experiment teams do. They, have to ta they, they, they cannot take picture everywhere. So they have to target. And this typically this target, this targeting exercise is done based on science merit. And the science merit, how do you do it? Well, a mapping. So you actually figure out whether an area need to have more observation or not. It is another double blade because uh, sometimes you see something interesting, so you want to target it. But maybe the lack of detailed square are not uh, showing you something that is even more interesting. And then what is interesting is arbitrary. That's why there is a balance, which is a tricky one, between thematic mapping and science target-based mapping. It's not always something that you really think every day, but if you are in a mission team and you in an experiment team and you want to collect data, that's a big problem because at the end of the day, uh, these are tax uh, uh experiments, taxpayer paid experiments, and uh, um, you want to maximize the science uh, and not only necessarily the science interest of um, someone in the team. That's why I say it's somewhat iterative. Now back to the size. Yes, if you want to have uh, an informed choice of where you land. Now, how can you inform yourself? For example, if you have no other data, what do you do? Well, you just don't know. If you have to land in a place where you have no other data, you can just stand down from me because you, you, there's nothing that can help. If you have some data that can help you drive in the decision, and this is not only a platform us. I mean, for Hayabusa uh, to a mascot, it was the very same. Before landing in a place, you want to have an idea, first of all, if it's safe, because maybe you, you don't manage to land, but also of observing something that can be uh, relevant and interesting, which means that choosing sites as a very strong link with the amount and quality of the unrelated data that you have over the solar system body and over the site. And through time, this is an example for Mars, but for the moon or itself will be similar. You have a growing set of data that can help you making an educated choice. Viking didn't have much. They have just the Viking orbiter. Yet, they did a, a remarkable job. But Finder was having very little more than that. The Mer rovers, they had a bit more, but not that much. What is really becoming a bit of a, you know, a, a 2000 or late 2000 or early 2010 luxus uh, is actually the fact that we had so many orbiters. You remember the first uh, timeline of exploration on Mars, which means that also the data set that you can base your choices on is getting very large. It's not growing exponentially, of course, and more or less we are stuck in a few years because there's not that many orbiters more, but it's still remarkably rich and useful. 
And then you see it's a, it's a multi-scale problem because you have many, many um, experiments and data that are helping you choosing a, a, a site. In order to choose a site, you have both to put science and engineering, well, most engineering because a, a, a scientifically sound site where you press uh, doesn't bring anything. So compromises are needed, but the same thing at another scale is also when you want to image locally with ground truth, with the rover, with the lander sample, when you want to collect data, and eventually when you want to cache them for eventual sample return. This, you cannot do it on Osiris. This, you cannot do it on Ayabusa. You cannot do it on Stardust. But you can do it on Mars, and you can do it on the moon, because you have time and the multitude of, of missions and experiments to explore an area with a render that maybe you chose before for mapping, based on mapping, and to choose your sample. Uh, this is a very lucky case, actually, which is possible only on very few places. On Venus, it will also be very difficult to do it, right? So this kind of uh, uh, special uh, uh, treatment, you only get it on Mars and the Moon, effectively. But geologic mapping has value beyond that. It does, of course, support science. Uh, it does support evaluating resources uh, and managing them, uh, support risk assessment. Uh, and these are all things that are uh, routinely done in centuries, essentially, um, on Earth. On planetary mapping, we are still a bit still limited to the first couple of bullets. Actually, the first, even the second, is not that much. And when it comes to risk assessment, it's still mostly risk for landers or for rovers. Land use, well, is not really yet an issue, but uh, with human exploration, it will be an issue. Infrastructure, like, you know, imagine the availability of source material to do 3D printing with the solar furnaces melting the regolith on the moon. All this stuff will be coming up and mapping will have role, some role in it. On top of it, there is something which is not really routinely done nowadays, where mapping, as I say, is uh, the counterpart of environmental protection, which is a bit different, actually, because planetary protection is not quite what we consider environmental protection here. But for planetary protection, mapping is very uh, important. I don't know if, if you think of that, the special region for Mars, areas where you can have potentially liquid water. Well, actually, one thing is saying, well, there could be a special region. One thing is, uh, is assessing it, for example, using, I don't know, subsurface mapping radar uh, or geomorphology to figure out the areas with the regolith with the high volatile concentration, which means that geologic mapping can be used in a variety of applications that are far beyond uh, pure science. Um, this clearly was well known in the beginning and from the early days of planetary exploration, although the, the motivation of going to the moon was not only to do mapping and geology, mainly was not, uh, geology training and having, for example, the mission to maximize the science return was key. And here you see in a photo, the training of the astronauts of the Apollo by USPS in the, in the sixth system, this did help a lot to really maximize the science output of Apollo because the astronauts, they were mostly non-geologists, yet they did a very fair job in collecting samples and data, despite the fact there was essentially only one geology resource, Arizon Smith. Which means that geology and mapping are not only skills useful for geologists, but also useful for non-geologists that end up exploring the planet. This is an example of recent ones. Of course, this is Matthias Maurer, so an astronaut that was on the ISS, but who knows, and maybe in the next year, he or his colleagues will go to the moon. And using the tools developed, I'm talking tools about hardware, uh, like this replicas of the, of, the, of the tools they are handling, of Apollo, is still actually valuable. So technology improved a lot. But the approach of the 
field of field geologists, uh, like it's similar to the one of two decades ago, it still is evolving, but the principles are the very same, which means that many things that have been done 50 years ago are still much valid. And again, back to the concept of the platforms, platforms do have a role in supporting mapping, even if mapping itself is done by all. And you can imagine these people not sitting on the Canary Islands, but sitting on the moon, probably this, web, this site would have been already well imaged by an orbiter, and then the choice of where to go with the rover and the people will have been made based on this data. So again, it's an iterative process. Um, in general, and these are the last things that I will mention in the next few uh, tenths of minutes, contextual information is key. And this is true for mapping, it's true to many, for many things, uh, geophysics and geology and how they're collected in a certain site are also important. In this case, obviously the, the, the choice was limited because uh, the Apollo site had the limited uh, extension, extent, and uh, experiments were run there. But when you're conducting any kind of observation with in situ observation, with sample return even more, the context is key. And uh, while here you can see that maybe the local context is some certain regulates uh, in the northern plains of Mars, so there is uh, uh, fine material, uh, maybe clay size, uh, uh, silt size, there is some kind of gravel, there's uh, maybe some, some brine or some uh, uh, ice uh, and volatiles. Uh, this is a local context. Whether this is uh, embedded in a broader context of periglacial uh, uh, environment, that's something that the orbital data will tell you. And of course, they drove even the, the choice of the landing site on the first place. But it's a multi scale problem that is also treated multi scale with a variety of resolutions. And this is where really ground truth is important in general for remote sensing, but specifically for planetary geologic mapping exploration, because it tells uh, putting some kind of boundary conditions fixed onto the, 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 the contextual information, which may be uh, not necessarily constrained. I mean, we are talking, for example, of, of uh, areas on Mars when we really don't know if the surface was sedimentary or, or, or volcanic. And this is, seems to be stupid, but that's where we are still. There are debates on, 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 on such details, which on Earth we will not consider them details. I mean, you will know very well if you are working on a basalt or on a limestone. But the point is that if you are working, and on Mars you are not working, or at least not us, not yet, uh, uh, but rovers do. Which means that precise observation and multi-scale context is key to provide uh, uh, information on geological environment uh, and overall geologic context of an area. And this helps dramatically. The problem is that you have very limited ground truth because you have very limited number of missions that are either lander or rover based producing ground truth data. Even more for places that are as arch as Venus, uh, where maybe one day there will be rovers, but at the moment we just had a few landers static uh, that they were uh, uh, rugged enough to survive for a few hours and to collect data, which is it's actually amazing in itself considering the, the physical conditions and uh, at the surface. So we are constrained, but these constraints allow to design red lander or rover missions that are able to collect data in the particularly constrained environment. Venus is again an extreme one, but there are many extremes. There are extremely low gravities, where if you are landing too fast and you bounce, maybe you are uh, at escape velocity. Uh, or if you're getting stuck in a crevasse between uh, blocks like the poor file, uh, you're getting lost until they find you. Or if you are jumping uh, uh, like mascots on uh, on Ryugu, uh, um, you may jump quite a lot uh, before reaching your uh, final resting or measurement place. So there is a wide range of constraints, and even missions that have 
a book for like uh, uh, Huygens uh, with Cassini to uh, well now decades ago or the future exploration missions. Uh, I mean, uh, a Dragonfly will be a drone, but uh, there will be possibly a future mission using uh, uh, rods and uh, submersible uh, um, elements. All of them are different things. And while you may consider Huygen as not something that is uh, mapping, actually it is mapping because during the sand it was mapping the surface. And subsurface mapping, for those of you doing marine geology, is also mapping. And you can very well imagine in uh, missions that are targeting subsurface oceans where uh, uh, with suitable, of course, bedrock, uh, uh, multi-beam could be done at where than on our seas and oceans. Plus, context is key to collect the samples, to repeat it two times, and uh, that's quite obvious, uh, but getting to go to obtain a core of marked uh, regulator rocks without knowing the samples will dramatically diminish the value of science, which means that mapping and context are key for any kind of mission. Unless you're talking of a rubble pile where mapping perhaps has a bit of a less important, but yet it can be very important because you can still have local heterogeneity that you want to see to characterize. Back to this, you can skip. And there is another aspect that I want to touch upon, which is mobility. When you explore from the, from the orbit and you're using only uh, orbital data, you have a lot of mobility. You can move with your eyes on the map. But when you have to get ground truth, uh, mobility is another story. And in fact, for the Apollo or like the NASA rover mission from Mars, uh, um, mobility was making a difference was making a difference because it was able to allow different geologic contexts, different deposits, which means going also broader uh, back in time and covering uh, uh, a wider uh, range of geologic uh, time and events that were documented. Plus, uh, depending on where you are and how much time you have, you may travel centimeters, meters, kilometers, tens of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, Apollo 11 didn't have too much time. Obviously, also the spatial scale of exploration was in it. Apollo 17, over multiple days, clearly had more time. That's why even with, with, with a proper uh, a long range rover, it was possible to uh, cover uh, large areas. And again, the same applies even more to multi-month or multi-year missions like MSL or March 2020 of the Marine, like in this case, where really uh, traverses were possible over uh, several kilometers, which means that really the, the scale of the geological understanding is higher because obviously you, you can cover uh, more units, you can have an idea of more processes and, uh, and, and time involved. Now, USGS did pioneer this, both for the map side of things, but also for the training of astronauts, uh, and in general for the support of the planetary geology community. And in fact, although it started to support NASA and US exploration, USGS astrogeology was supporting globally and was actually giving help to all of us that were starting to do this kind of mapping work across the world, uh, and still does. Now we just, of course, have a bit more uh, uh, help because there are also other initiatives like the Planet Team Up, which supports European and global mapping. Um, it's part of uh, a series of uh, services and activities, um, but it does support uh, the community via training, via data services, but training is an important part for it because uh, a lot of things uh, if well documented, can speed up the mapping process and limiting uh, roadblocks or, or bottlenecks. I would like you to uh, have a look, not now, but when you are with time, the level of documentation that is there and pointing to other resources. That's also something that uh, I'm not signing in here, but I, 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 I will, will show you in a moment. 
there are some tools that you may find yourself useful. Um, and there is also uh, a wide range of projects. Some of the people that are working on them probably are there with you. Uh, well, actually, mostly science-driven, uh, so they're not systematic, most of them projects uh, in different areas from the solar system. Um, the entry points are several. I would suggest for those that are not yet familiar with mapping, uh, we'll have a look at those. And there are some things that can maybe help, which are the former uh, winter schools of GMAP that have been held in the last three years. And the next one will be next year in January. Plus some good old books and resources are always there. And um, basically, it may take some time to get started, but by far less than it used to be decades ago. And definitely, you have a, a larger network to tap on when it comes to, to support. So now we use a large part of our slot, but uh, uh, of course, we have some time for discussion. Um, and please have a look, not necessarily only at this, but at the different uh, resources that I share, because some of them may be quite useful. That's just one. Uh, but I hope that something can be of use for you. Uh, this is minor. So if you have any questions or anything you want to raise and discuss, feel free. But also, if it comes later, just drop me an email or a message. Thank you. <laughs>